Boldwood presents Payback, written by Edie Baylis and read by Annie Aldington. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue 13th of February, 1996 Seb Stoker stared with impatience at the sweating, shivering man cowering beneath him. I won't ask you again, so I suggest you think very clearly before you answer. He casually inspected his fingernails, frowning at the hint of dirt underneath a nail on his right hand. Something else to put on the list of things to get straight. I'd also suggest you do so quickly. I'm a busy man, so time spent on you is limited. Seb's green eyes flicked over the back of the large Erdington lockup to the wall where the rack of metal cabinets that housed his firm's collection of safes had once stood. His fists clenched. As instructed, the area was now cleared. He didn't need a constant reminder of what the firm, or rather he, had lost or more accurately, had been stolen. And if the theory was correct, the theft was aided by this low life. Seb returned his glare to the trembling man, the mere sight of this loser, a paid member of their firm, who it seemed had made the unforgivable error of opening his fat gob to cause this disaster, boiled his piss further. He was acutely aware that his brother, Neil, had been lax for leaving the safe's codes on his mobile phone long enough for this yellow-bellied turd to learn of them, but gross stupidity had not warranted or forced this piece of shit to take it upon himself to wander around flapping his gums. And flapping his gums to a certain somebody who turned him over. This runner, Simon Parker, may not have physically lifted the contents of the safes whilst the Stoker's casino had burnt down around them, but his big mouth had certainly enabled the act, and for that he would pay. Seb glanced at his twin brothers, standing either side of the runner, waiting impatiently for the nod to start work on information, Andrew more so than Neil. But Seb had already decided that this time he would do the job himself, if only to release some steadily festering pent-up bitterness and frustration that had mounted up during the rapid chain of events over the last month. At this precise second, the firm had lost its spare stash of millions. His casino was raised to the ground. Half his staff were being temporarily employed at the Violet Orchid, courtesy of his fiancée, Samantha. And if he didn't sort this shit out, his and Sam's home would be the next thing to cop it. And that he drew the line at. Someone would suffer, and this wanker made a decent starting point. Seb's eyes narrowed back to the man in front of him, his swift turn towards one of the many workbenches, causing a gibbering sound to escape from the trussed-up man's mouth. Yeah, this bloke knew what was coming. Everybody knew what happened if you fucked with the stokers, or at least they had. But being as someone believed they'd escape retribution after pulling a robbery and arson, the city needed a fast and sharp reminder. And Simon Parker would be the poster boy. Yanking a pair of pliers from a holdle, Seb dropped to his haunches in front of the bound man, making sure to balance his weight more on the leg that hadn't taken a bullet the night everything hit the fan. It might not have been long since Andrew had fished the metal from his thigh, but thankfully, short of it still being a bit stiff, there were no ongoing problems. He'd been lucky. This man, however, would not be so lucky. Still nothing to say. Seb's teeth glinted in the illumination from the bank of fluorescent strip lights overhead as his eyes rested on Simon Parker. Try thinking about what you did after nosing through me brother's phone whilst you sat all comfy-like in the van. Remember? The night you were instructed to bring him here to drop off money. Simon's eyes darted to Neil and Andrew as they moved to flank Seb. I didn't, I... As Simon tried to move away from the jaws of the pliers, Seb grinned. The prick couldn't move anywhere. The gaffer tape securing his arms to the chair put pay to that. 
It also held them in the perfect position for this. Clasping the tips of the pliers over Simon's right thumbnail, Seb ripped the large nail clean off its bed with minimum effort. The howl of pain was pleasurable, but if the man found that painful, he was in for a rude awakening. Now let's think about this carefully, Seb smiled coldly. After going through my brother's phone and getting the codes, who did you deem it wise to pass them to? Simon howled again as the next two fingernails were removed. His shaking increased. He wasn't stupid enough to believe Seb Stoker had even warmed up yet. I, I, I didn't know through the phone. Neil dropped it. I, I mean, Mr. Stoker dropped it. I just picked it up from the footwell and... Let's not be finicky, Seb said, his rage a simmering time bomb as he glared at Neil for good measure. Drop the phone in the fucking footwell, Christ. How you got the code is irrelevant, but who you gave it to isn't. I, I didn't give it to anyone. I... The crack to Simon's jaw from Seb's fist echoed around the storage unit. The chair rocked unsteadily while Seb stared at the blood trickling from the man's mouth. We paid you good money to work for us. We employed you for fucking years, and this is how you repaid us, he screamed, his controlled demeanour deserting him. Grabbing a fistful of hair, Seb wrenched Simon's head back. Andrew, salt the teeth. Andrew stepped forward with a wide grin. It had been a while since he'd removed anyone's teeth, and he was looking forward to it. Simon's eyes widened at the long-nosed pliers in Andrew Stoker's hand. No, please! I... Jamming the pliers into the man's mouth, Andrew yanked out a front tooth. The scream going straight through his head. Oh, these are fucking rotten. They're like cottage cheese. Seb snatched the thin pliers from Andrew's hand. Give me those. I might as well lift the whole fucking lot, being as this prick has nothing to say. He tugged harder on Simon's hair, scowling as the man fruitlessly tried to close his mouth, rivulets of blood cascading down his chin. Whoa! Whoa! Oh! Simon squawked. What? What did you fucking say? Seb roared. I can't understand you. Oh, fuck this. Grab the bolt cutters, Neil. Do this wanker's fingers while I do his fucking gob. No! No! Simon wailed the chair jumping around, despite Andrew's firm grasp of his shoulders. Seb released Simon's hair and slowly walked around the front of the man. Two seconds is what you've got to talk. His eyes narrowed malevolently. Which firm did you sell us out to? Who paid you? Oh, oh, I didn't sell them, Simon gabbled, his mouth a sea of pain. I didn't, I swear, Mr Stoker. The only thing I think I did was I said something. I was pissed up and I... You were pissed up? And you think you said something to someone? Seb raged incredulously. Are you taking the mick? Ah, he's talking shite, Andrew barked. Let's just get on with it. No, I did. I'm sure I did. No, oh no, I did, Simon blathered sweat running down his brow to mix with the blood dripping onto his T-shirt. Seb pushed himself into the runner's face. Well, Simon racked his brains. It was true that he hadn't sold the codes, but he had said something once. He might as well say, because he had nothing to lose. The stokers appreciated honesty. Everyone knew they were fair. <laughs> it was this bloke. Which bloke did you tell? Seb spat each word through clenched teeth. Whoever was told was the crux of the shit he was now dealing with. The shit put on Sam and the shit he was about to unleash on all of them to dig them out of this mess. And it was all down to this waste of fucking oxygen. I was in the whistling pig, having a drink with a bird called Marlene, when some geezers caught me over. What geezers? Neil pressed the weight of his part of this disaster weighing heavily on his shoulders. Oh, oh, I don't know. No one important. Just blokes. But, but there was a guy with them uh, asking about the poker tournaments. I said I could get him a VIP pass. 
The words spilt from Simon's broken mouth. He could still save himself. He knew he could. His eyes darted between the three Stoker men pleadingly. Please, you've got to believe me. I never meant to say anything out of turn. I was drunk and showing off. The name of this man? Seb flexed a pair of bolt cutters now in his hand. Simon couldn't move his gaze from the jaws of the vicious-looking implement. He'd lose his fingers and probably his toes if he didn't talk. He'd heard they'd done this before. I, I think his name was Dan. N no, it was. I'm sure of it. Andrew rolled his eyes. Dan? Dan fucking who? I, I don't know. I'd never seen him before. I said I was a trusted member of the firm and could prove it because I knew the codes for the safes. Simon's face burnt with humiliation. I don't remember giving him the actual numbers, but I must have. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I... You pathetic bastard. Seb's hand shook with rage. If this prick was to be believed, then his firm had lost its capital and the casino, and his family and the woman he loved would soon be put in jeopardy, all because of a boast. This is bollocks, Neil muttered. It's not, I swear. I oh, know it sounds pathetic. I've always wanted to be someone like you lot. I've got a wife and three kids. Please, I'll do anything to make it up to you. I'd... And you don't know anything else about this damn bloke. Seb's rage morphed into a dangerously quiet calm. Dan wasn't a name of anyone in any of the firms he knew, and he knew pretty much all of them, major and minor. No. No, I'd tell you if I did, Simon gibbered. I'm not stupid. I'm telling you everything. I'd never seen him before, but I'd recognise him again because he only had one hand. <laughs> Look, please, I'd... Seb jerked his head at Andrew. Let him up. He watched his brother staring at him in stunned silence. Untie him. You're letting him go, Andrew gasped. After what he's responsible for? Seb shrugged. Ribbing him to pieces won't change anything. We need to locate this one-armed tosser. He's the one. That's if he's true, Neil muttered, reluctantly slicing the taping around Simon's wrists and ankles. Thank you, Mr Stoker. You don't know what this means. I'll do anything to put this right, Simon cried. There's very little you can do to fix what you've caused. Stony-faced, Seb watched Simon stagger from the chair, stumbling as the feeling returned to his stiff legs. Ignoring the disdain over his decision plastered across his brother's faces, a small smirk tugged at the corner of his mouth. Thanks again, Mr Stoker, Simon stuttered, barely able to believe his good fortune. People always say you're fair and... Not as much as you perhaps think, Seb said. He'd been fair over many things in his life, but not this fair. Oh, brothers, ye of little faith. Simon Parker didn't even get the chance to flinch when a bullet shot a hole clean through the centre of his forehead and he crumpled silently to the floor. Chapter One One week later. Not for the first time, Marina Devlin scowled at the large-breasted woman with bleached hair sitting at the kitchen table in her overtight skirt and barely there top. The tart was twenty, if she was a day, and Mickey was old enough to be the woman's father. Unfortunately, Mickey was Marina's father, and each time she saw him, she was reminded exactly how disappointing that fact was. But desperate times meant desperate measures, and her good-for-nothing, pointless, selfish bastard of a father had been the only one to turn to in her hour of need. For once, he'd delivered, inasmuch as he'd dragged his sorry ass up from London, but not without bringing this brainless limpet with him, for reasons Marina was yet to deduce. A week now, the three of them had been holed up in this shithole of a flat in Bearwood, and yet nothing had been done to locate her waster boyfriend, Dan Marlowe. 
who had done one with the stoker's money that should have been hers. Nothing at all. Not that she'd seen Dan as a boyfriend for some time, and regardless of whether the bozo still believed somewhere in that dense head of his that there could possibly be anything left between them after any of this, then he had even less brain cells remaining than Marina had thought. But none of that changed that she'd been forced to put up with watching this bimbo Mickey had dragged along with him, draping herself over him and listening to the dulcet tones of them shagging every single bloody night. It was getting right on her wick. More so, considering she was stuck here, unable to risk setting foot outside due to having two major Birmingham firms after her blood, and the final insult, short of Samantha Reynold, up until relatively recently her previously unknown and thoroughly undeserving sister, still lording it up around the city, was that Dan wasn't already six feet under. Furthermore, as a final twist of the knife, the day he'd buggered off, Dan had also pinched her one remaining credit card with a few quid left on it. Marina's brows narrowed. If Dan had any sense, he'd have disappeared off to a sun-drenched Brazilian beach, somewhere he couldn't be located. But despite him somehow pulling this off behind her and her brother Grant's back, she had the distinct impression he was still in this city. And she had to find him. There was no way she was letting that loser wander off with the money that should have been hers, not in a million years. But without Grant around to help, she really was on her own. Her mind digressed once again to spare a thought over what had happened to Grant. Of course, after she'd shot him, his body would have been quickly disposed of by those stoker bastards. By now, her brother had most likely been dumped, along with a sack of rocks, amongst the general rubble at the bottom of the gas basin. She raised her chin. Grant shouldn't have got in the bloody way, should he? Had he just remained where he'd stood and let her crack on with shooting Samantha Reynolds through the head, he'd still be here. Her mouth formed a narrow line. Grant didn't deserve her sympathy, or even a thought. He'd been the one to waver in his loyalties. If her stupid, deluded brother hadn't been so desperate to protect that woman, then none of this would have happened. Samantha would be dead as a door now, and they would have had it away on their toes with Stoker's money, like they'd planned. Instead, now Dan was in receipt of millions, and she was stuck here. With them. How long is she going to be here? Marina snapped, watching her father shovel the remains of last night's Chinese takeaway into his mouth. The thought of eating that shit at any time of the day, let alone for breakfast, was one step beyond. You're supposed to be sorting this out, not here for a holiday or a fucking shag fest with your latest tart. Mickey Devlin's fork paused halfway to his mouth, a noodle dropping down the front of his stained vest. Be patient, dear daughter, he smirked. Things take time to plan. Don't stress. It's all in hand. The only thing in your hands are her tits, Marina glared at the blonde, who was oblivious to what was being said her concentration solely on the latest copy of Hello magazine. Why is she actually here? Mickey ran his tongue slowly along his teeth. Sophie's here for distraction. He held his hands up. And before you come out with another bitchy comment, not just as a distraction to me, a distraction in the big scheme of things. Marina's eyes narrowed. Then I'd appreciate knowing exactly what part of your alleged plan relies on using a thick bitch with plastic tits. Standing up, Mickey brushed the clods of noodles from his vest, rubbing the mess into the carpet with his boot. Like I said, patience. All you got to do is trust me. You'll see. The harsh truth was that he didn't have a plan. Not yet, but he would. This miserable bitch of a daughter of his was too highly strung to understand that the best laid plans appeared from the ether. That was what he relied on anyway. Dan Marlowe would be tracked down somehow. But in the interim. Grabbing Sophie's arm, Mickey winked suggestively. Come on, sugar tits. Get your ass into gear. Oh, I haven't finished with you yet. Marina scowled at the back of Sophie's head focusing on the dark roots of her yellow hair as the pair left the room. Great. Another round of listening to disgusting noises through the cardboard walls.
She snatched her cigarettes from the formica tabletop. Her father had better come up with something and do it soon, because otherwise everything would be down to her and her alone. As usual. Samantha Reynolds walked through the games room of the Violet Orchid Casino, nodding to her staff. It had been a decent day so far. Having earlier spoken to the rehab clinic, she was pleased with the account of her mother's progress. According to what was said, Linda wasn't yet at the point where she could have visitors, but progress had been made, and all being well, this would change next week. It was good news. Although the clinic cost a fortune, it was worth every penny to remove the addiction issues her mother had always struggled with. That, and right some of the wrongs that bastard Tom Bedworth had caused for Linda. Sam chewed her bottom lip as she continued out of the games room and along the staff corridor to her office. Over the last two weeks, she'd put feelers out for the character from her mother's past who had shown up again like a bad smell. The bastard who, not content with keeping Linda prisoner and drugged up to the eyeballs in the attic of his filthy doss hole of a brothel, had spent the rest of his time orchestrating, running and profiting from a place specialising in grooming young girls to sell themselves to equally foul men. After Linda's experience, the crux of why Sam had not even been aware of her real mother's existence until relatively recently meant the subject was both a pet hate and a mission. Now she knew where Tom Bedworth operated from, she'd felt able to get revenge. Seb had gone to the dump on the Hagley Road, as promised, but Bedworth's club, the Aurora, had been abandoned. The building was as deserted as the Mary Celeste, so the man she was desperate to make pay was still at large. Somewhere. And she wouldn't rest until he suffered. Until both he and Marina suffered. Because that was another person she owed. Marina Devlin another of Linda's daughters, a sister Sam had been unaware of. Storming into the orchid and trying to kill her had made things even worse. Remorse and sadness filtered her thoughts, remembering Trevor Jensen getting shot at the hands of this psychotic woman. But he hadn't been Trevor, had he? He had been Grant, Grant Devlin, Marina's brother, her brother. Sam had liked the man, but both he and Marina had wanted her killed and that hurt. Seb also getting shot that night as collateral damage in Marina's twisted plan also meant there could be no forgiveness for the woman. She had to pay for what she'd done. But Marina had escaped. She was still out there somewhere, and the nagging worry of her returning to complete what she'd started was never far from Sam's mind. This burning need for revenge didn't change that the priority was split with getting the stokers back up and running. Sam knew that Seb's firm and casino were down the pan because of her. The only reason he'd been shot was because of her too. Sam's heels clicked loudly on the corridor as she hastened towards her office. The meet was due the minute Seb returned, with what she hoped would be the full details for the heist, the one he'd kept close to his chest until he knew exactly which way it would happen. And no... There was no way she would ever have taken him up on his instruction to walk away while she still could. Seb Stoker was her life. The reason her heart beat. She loved him like no other. To walk away to save her own neck was unthinkable. Whatever happened, they were in this together, and neither hell nor high water would detract from that. Sam's face set determinedly as she reached her office door. Seb had moved mountains to keep her safe and protected, so if he went down, she was going with him. Plus, if he didn't rectify what had been lost, it would be his undoing. Seb wasn't the sort to cope with being second best, or taking a back seat. It would eat away at his soul until there was nothing left, and she would never allow that to happen. Sam would do whatever she had to do to help, regardless of what that was. Chapter 2 As they rushed from the foyer out underneath the front canopy of the hotel, leaving the Hyatt receptionist staring after them in confusion, Dan Marlowe grabbed Tom Bedworth's sleeve. What are we doing? he hissed. You said we couldn't leave until you were sure the coast was clear. Tom shrugged the fingers of Dan's intact hand off his jacket. We haven't got a lot of fucking choice. 
From the window of their junior suite on the 23rd floor, he'd seen the police car roll up outside the hotel for the second day in a row, the officers making their way into the reception. He'd hardly dared move for what seemed like an indeterminate amount of time, paranoid even the sound of his breathing would expose his presence, as well as the location of the holdalls in the wardrobe that was stuffed with the contents of the stoker's safes. As well as successfully burning the stoker's casino to the ground, thanks to Dan's helpful inside information, he'd lifted the entire stash of those wankers' money from under their noses. And he couldn't think of more deserving victims than Seb Stoker and his thug family, who thought themselves clever by involving themselves with Tom's unwanted daughter, Samantha. But the last thing Tom wanted was anyone finding out that he'd been behind any of it, the police included. If the old Bill were here again digging around, even if they weren't digging for him, it still might inadvertently highlight the trail leading to the owner of the car which had disappeared from the hotel's underground car park a week and a half ago. The motor used to dispatch a two-faced little whore. The one he'd taken the opportunity to mow down before she caused further problems. As well as becoming surplus to requirements at his own club, before that went to shit, Deb Banner had been involved in something something that also included the stokers, so she'd had to go, via any available means. He only hoped she'd been removed in time. No, he didn't want any of those things coming to light. A layer of sweat beaded on Tom's forehead as he furtively glanced around. Christ, he'd been all but sorted. Everything was in place. Aside from still being lumbered with this moronic fool, He'd been a gnat's cock away from Utopia. Tom glared at Dan with building resentment. That was why they'd been holed up in this bloody hotel, waiting for the passports to arrive to spirit them away to a new life elsewhere. His jaw clenched. That was until the passports were delayed. There had been no update since the man tasked with supplying the fake passports before the shit hit the fan got himself shot in a boozer. The fucker could have carked it by now, for all Tom knew, so he had to draw the line. He could no longer sit waiting like a target. They had to shift, and the minute the police car left, Tom knew it was time to move. The Hyatt doorman manoeuvred closer, his gloved hand gesturing to a line of waiting black cabs, queuing hopefully in front of the hotel's entrance. Taxi, sir? Tom swung around, his nerves frayed. No. No, we're fine, thank you. Perhaps I can help you to your car with your bags? The doorman reached towards Tom's holdalls. I said I'm fine. Tom swiped the bags as far away as possible, and without looking back, stomped down the entrance steps with Dan close on his heels. What are you doing? Dan hissed. We need a taxi. Not that I've got a clue where we're going, but we can't be seen around here. He glanced opposite at the blackened remains of the Royal Peacock Casino. The stokers could be watching us right now. If they were watching us, or knew who we were, we'd already have an hole in the back of our heads. Tom upped his pace across the hotel's turning circle to Broad Street. The doorman could pass our destination to the stokers, or even the fucking cops, so it's safer to get a cab from the road. Dan's sallow face coloured with a tinge of green. Cops. Why do you think... Stop asking bloody questions. Tom waved down an oncoming black cab. Always fucking asking questions. The cab hadn't fully stopped before Tom yanked open the door and clambered in, throwing the heavy holdalls into the footwell. Frankly, please, mate. Put your foot down. Dan lurched into one of the backward-facing seats as the taxi accelerated. Frankly. Why were they going to frankly? Have you found us somewhere else to stay? Nah, we're going for a fucking picnic. Turning away, Tom stared out the window. Dan really was a thick prick. And no, he didn't know for certain whether they'd got anywhere to stay, but the place they were heading to was the only location he could think of where there was little chance of them being turned away. Andrew Stoker steepled his fingers under his chin and mulled over what had been said. He glanced at Neil, the expression on his twin's face, one of equal concern. He couldn't say he blamed his brother. This was risky, to say the least. In fact, 
Risky barely touched the sides of what might unfurl if things went wrong. Seb's planning of this heist, to swap out a container load of cocaine under the noses of the real owners, was immense. It was true that only something of this magnitude could pull in the amount of money needed to get the firm and casino back on track and fix what had happened. But this was one hell of a biggie. Andrew then looked at Sam, her stunning face showing no hint of alarm, reminding him how wrong he'd been to try and impede Seb from having anything to do with the woman. His initial belief that she was detrimental to his brother, the firm and the family, had been a gross oversight. Admittedly, the chain of events sparking the collapse of their family had stemmed from Sam, but it could have easily spawned from any of them. This kind of life always held those risks and possibilities. But Sam's steadfast devotion to Seb was a godsend. She'd proved her love and loyalty fourfold, and he suspected she would have no issue with what was being put into motion. He focused back on his eldest brother. Do we know when it would take place? Seb gave a slight shake of his head. Not yet. It's a question of keeping my ear close to the ground and awaiting the nod from my contact. Once I get that, it's all systems go. Fuck me. This is heavy shit, Neil muttered. You're sure we're not being set up? As sure as I can be. Unfortunately, nothing is guaranteed, but it's a risk we need to take. Seb stared at Neil long and hard. He required all hands on deck for this one like never before and couldn't have any dampness put on anything. Well, not all hands on deck. That would be far too dangerous. Only their inner circle would be party to it. Involving anyone else only heightened the chance of betrayal. They knew only too well that people's heads could be turned for the right price. Even the firm's trusted accountant would have no knowledge of this. Until afterwards. Kevin scanned the sheet of paper containing the figures Seb handed out and shrugged his huge shoulders. All I'll say is that this will definitely provide the required money with plenty to spare. Seb nodded. That it would. And he just had to pray that luck, as well as a lot of other things, was on their side. The container is coming from Paraguay, Sam asked, still astounded at the colossal amount they stood to gain if this worked. And it had to work. Seb was right. There was no other way to raise the needed capital so quickly. Seb poured himself a large whiskey from the decanter and sipped at it thoughtfully. I don't know exactly where it's originating from yet. Paraguay, Ecuador or Colombia. Either way, it's routing via Portugal before docking in England. Neil frowned. Who exactly are we ripping off? The Colombians? We don't want to start a war with them. It will jeopardise the dealings we already hold with them. Seb bristled. Yes, they did have deals with the Colombians, and always had done. The Stoker and Reynolds firms held a monopoly over the coke trade in Birmingham, but drugs had always been a smaller part of the facets of the Stoker firm, the Irish gun deals taking the majority of side turnover. But their long and profitable relationship with the Irish had turned sour of late. In their infinite wisdom, the men from the Emerald Isle had decided to retract their prior offer of laundering a big chunk of surplus money after the arson and robbery to the Stoker firm, most probably feeling it unlikely the favour would ever be returned. Seb scowled. Despite their past dealings, anyone who believed him finished or held such little faith in his ability to recover from such a disaster was not someone he would go out of his way to deal with. Unfortunate, but that's how it had to be. So the decision to pull back from concentrating on arms and up their stake in the cocaine trade was made. Besides, not only was there more markup, but with what Seb had got planned, a wider and better network of supply routes was needed. And as for ripping people off, Seb didn't much like ripping anyone off and appreciated Neil rubbing his face in that even less. We're not shortchanging or pulling one over on the Colombians or any of our South American counterparts he snapped. The deal has already been done. The only people to lose out here will be people we already owe payback to. A smile crept over his face. It's time to call in an old debt from our father's day. He moved his gaze to Andrew. Jog any memories? 
You're not by any chance referring to what I think you're referring to, are you? The story we heard every time Dad got pissed. You've got it in one, Seb grinned. Sam sat forward, confused. What am I missing? Seb gave Sam's hand a squeeze. Wolverhampton. Those fuckers have never been happy not having the monopoly over the coke trade in Broome as well as the black country. They've been trying to take over for years. Andrew nodded. Our dad got ripped off by them way back when he first started the firm. He agreed to deal with the Ross firm, but they stiffed him. He very nearly finished his firm before it even started. Dad ended up taking out half the Ross firm over it, including the main man to regain his foothold. After that, an uneasy truce was made. Even with this, it always rankled Dad, but a deal is a deal. Sam frowned. So why now? Seb's smile dropped. The long and short of it is, over the years, the firm have developed a selective memory about their side of the deal and reverted to pushing for territory some time ago. They've always failed, as it's been easy enough to hold them off, but doing this kills two birds with one stone. Finishing his whiskey, Seb placed the glass back on the desk with a steady hand, being as he was forced to turn someone over, out of all the unpalatable options, this one was the most well-deserved and wasn't something he would lose sleep over. Sam frowned. If it's an old score, or could be construed as such, then I don't understand why this is so risky. Because, Neil muttered, the Rosses are a bunch of sneaky fuckers. If they find out we're behind this, it will declare war between us. That's always been on the cusp, but never materialised. The thing is, they've got stronger in recent years and are itching to take us on. As you can appreciate, with our current position, now is really not a good time for that to happen, hence the risk. Seb's lips pursed in irritation. You be right, Neil, but I don't intend on letting that happen. We'll be doing the switch at Bristol Docks, and if it's done to plan, no one will be any the wiser. And the amount of brass the coat coming in that container should fetch would make everything just fine. Chapter 3 Catching sight of herself in a shop window as she mixed with the throng of people pushing up and down the ramp in the centre of Birmingham made Marina cringe. With her beige mac, dodgy sunglasses and a pink headscarf, she looked like a washerwoman. But the choice of clothes the charity shop on Bearwood High Street had in her size for less than a tenner was limited. It wasn't a big deal. Not short term, anyway. It was more important not to be recognised. The chances of bumping into the Stokers or Samantha Reynold on the number 440 bus from Bearwood into the city centre was remote. But then, so were plenty of other things, and they had still happened. It was best not to take chances. Once she was kitted out with a decent disguise, she'd been in a better position to wander around unsuspected without looking like Hilda Ogden and stinking of mothballs. Getting a waft of the telltale smell of McDonald's as she neared the top of the ramp, Marina glanced with contempt at the people sitting in the window, cramming their faces. It was so busy in there, most customers were standing up, and the orders barked by the overworked staff rushing around behind the long counter, spilt through the open doors, hurting her ears. She'd never been a fan of McDonald's, but she was that starving, for once she'd consider making an exception. But she couldn't. Finding an acceptable disguise was more important. Plus, it wasn't like she had much money to play with now. Getting anything at all out of her tight-fisted father was difficult enough as it was. Shoving her way through the open doors into the palisades, Marina headed to the escalators. She knew exactly where she was going. The kiosks on the lower ground floor not only sold cheap stuff, but all manner of things. And there was one kiosk which sold wigs. At least... There had been when she'd come in here a few weeks ago. Travelling past the other set of escalators leading down to New Street Station, Marina glanced into one of the shops around the outskirts of the open plan area that stocked thigh-high boots and platform shoes in various colours, all suitable for her new look. She had to make money, as well as keep her ears to the ground. As much as her idea wasn't top of the list, she had a decent figure, nice tits, and could dance, so this was a workable solution. Getting on side with the sort of women who might reveal an inkling as to the movement of her errant thief of an ex-boyfriend was the only way. 
Dan had always believed her unaware, but she knew he frequented strip clubs and got through tarts like multi-pack crisps. She didn't imagine anything had changed since his disappearance, and if the man was still in Birmingham, which he was certain he was, then it wouldn't cross his tiny mind to keep out of sight and not frequent the most obvious places anyone with half a brain would think of looking first. Her chip nails dug into the palms of her hand. Oh, yes, Dan would no doubt be busy boasting of his exploits and flashing his stolen cash around like the fool he was. Hopefully, with insider info, his stupidity would lead her straight to him. And it had to, because it wasn't like her father had offered an alternative solution. All that Joker was doing was using her electric, so she needed a backup plan in the event he brought nothing to the table. With renewed determination, Marina strolled into the wig shop, her sights already set on the long auburn tresses perched on a polystyrene head at the back of the shop. Providing it didn't look too plastic close up, that would do nicely. It was the other end of the scale from her long blonde hair, and with a bit of fiddling in other areas, coupled with some nasty clothes, she'd have the perfect disguise. Luke Banner dragged the back of his sleeve across his face, smearing a thick line of snot over his cheek. He pulled himself to his feet. Why couldn't the papers leave him alone? He'd already given his response of how he felt about his only child being murdered and refused to talk about it any more. His comment to the Birmingham Mail was the only one he was willing to give. What did they expect him to say anyway? That he was fucking happy that his only daughter, the daughter he'd all but brought up by himself for the last few years since his wife had left him in the lurch, had been run over and killed by a pissed-up bastard or drugged-up twat. And not just run over by accident, but run over, reversed on, and then run over again, left like an animal to die in the road. Well, he wasn't happy. How could he be? Since Deb had stomped out of this house six months ago, with her sight set on better things than he could offer, he'd remained ever hopeful that one day, preferably before too long, he'd be reunited with his little girl. He no longer cared what she'd done. He'd got over her buggering off with that boyfriend. He'd forgiven that. He'd forgive anything if it meant he could bring her back to life. Luke staggered towards the front door, unable to get a hint of who was on the other side of the yellowing neck curtains with his drink-addled vision, but whoever it was, wasn't about to give up and leave. His teeth grated at the incessant banging, waiting for the door to fall in. It was about time the council replaced the bloody thing. Fucking rotten as hell it was. Luke pulled the door open his progress thwarted by a snagged off-cut of carpet covering the hallway floor. What the bloody hell do you want? He stopped abruptly, blinking at the two men on his doorstep. What the? Finally, Tom barked, barging inside. He glanced over his shoulder, making sure Dan followed him and that no one was lurking around outside who might recognise him. Planning to leave us standing there all day, were you? Shutting the door, Luke stared at the men who had pushed into his hallway. What are you doing here? Tom pasted on a sickly grin as he slapped his arm around Luke's shoulder. This is my mate, Dan. Dan, this is Luke. Dan smiled uncomfortably at the drunk man. I thought we'd swing by, Tom continued. We need a place to crash for a few days and I didn't think you'd mind. Pulling away. Luke swayed, his hand reaching to steady himself against the wall. He hadn't seen Tom Bedworth since the man had turned him over with that crack shop contract. And that was part of the reason Deb had walked out in the first place, believing he could no longer be trusted to provide for her. It's not a good sign at the moment, Luke said, moving back towards the door. Maybe another time. Tom slammed Luke against the wall the reverberation dislodging a plastic-framed print of Birmingham City FC from its nail. Actually, now is the perfect time. He replaced the snarl on his face with a practised grin and then smoothed down the lapels of Luke's stained sports jacket. Let's not fall out over this, my old mate. I don't hold it against you with what happened with our little venture. Against me, Luke gasped. You were the one who pulled the crack production. Then binned me off and you... You're confused. 
Tom smiled coldly. Ignoring Dan's concerned expression, he took Luke's arm and steered him towards where he remembered the living room to be in the small semi-detached house. You're a bit worse for wear. Have things been getting on top of you? Dan followed the two men into the cluttered sitting room, where empty cider cans and takeaway cartons littered the grubby carpet. Who the fuck was this bloke? And what was all this about crack? He didn't want to get involved in any more shit. They had a shed load of money on them, and if this bloke was a drug-addled nut job, he could also be a thief. What was Tom thinking? Look, maybe we should just go? Nonsense. Smiling viciously, Tom pushed Luke into the nearest chair. Luke's a good friend of mine, and it looks like you could do with some company, couldn't you, me old son? Luke winced as Tom slapped him on the back, the slap feeling like a thousand needles. He didn't want Bedworth here, but he didn't want any trouble either. He couldn't take it. Tom jerked his head in the direction of the kitchen. Grab some cans from the fridge, Dan. We'll have a drink and chat about old times. He waited until Dan reluctantly left the room before turning back to Luke. Now don't fuck me about, he hissed. We're staying here for as long as we need. I'm trusting you don't have a problem with that. His stained teeth bared into a mouldy grimace. You don't want further misfortune befalling you or your family, do you? Luke shook his head. Tom could make things worse by doing what he'd previously threatened and tell the council he'd been using the house to cook crack. He'd be sure to get kicked out then, and if that happened, all traces of what was left of his daughter and where she'd grown up would be taken from him. That was one prospect too much to bear, so he'd have to do what Tom said, however much he didn't want to. His eyes moved to the framed picture on the wall of Deb standing with him and his ex-wife, taken when they'd been a family, before everything went wrong. I thought you were still running that place up the ugly road, Luke muttered, wishing he had the balls to sling Bedworth, his lies and fake promises out of his house. But he'd never had the backbone to stand up to the man, even when they'd been at school, and certainly not now. Something else Deb had thrown at him just before she'd walked out. She'd said he was a coward, and she'd been right. The Aurora's hit a bit of a stumbling block, that's all. But things will be okay soon, Tom said, enjoying Luke's discomfort. It was pleasurable sitting in this man's home, knowing he'd been the one to offload the man's trog of a daughter. Obviously, he'd pretend he had no idea about Deb's demise, despite what he'd threatened the little scrubber with in the past. If Tom understood correctly, Luke was unaware his darling daughter had worked at the Aurora, and it was best to keep it that way. The thick fuck didn't have the first clue. It was laughable. Is that your daughter? Dan returned to the room, seeing where Luke's eyes rested. She's a little stunner. He handed Luke and Tom a can of Strongbow, failing to notice the warning glare on Tom's face, nor the tears brimming in Luke's eyes. He studied the photograph and frowned. She didn't half look like a girl I saw at your place a few weeks back, Tom. Nah, most definitely not, Tom said hastily. If Dan didn't shut the fuck up, he'd throttle him. My daughter's dead, Luke said hollowly. Ah, oh, shit, mate. I'm sorry to hear that, Tom exclaimed, the lies tripping easily from his mouth. Oh, my God, Dan gasped. What happened? Tom scowled harder. Shut the fuck up, Dan, you prick. A hit and run. Luke's voice was barely audible. His shaking fingers struggled to open the fresh can in his hand. Some bastard mowed her down. The funeral's tomorrow, and I don't know how I'll get through it. Dreadful. Just dreadful, Tom wittered. Taking Luke's can, he opened it and then deposited it back in the man's hand. But there you go, see? You shouldn't be on your own at a time like this. That must be why I was drawn to come here. Dan listened to Tom's bullshit. Shrugging, he turned back to stare at the photograph. Sure he'd seen that girl at the Aurora. Chapter 5 
Chapter 4 Waiting until Seb had ended the call and placed his mobile on the bedside table, Sam pushed herself up onto her elbows and pressed her lips to his. Problems? Seb traced his fingers down Sam's cheek, wishing he could remain exactly where he was. No, but I do have to go. Sam frowned. I didn't think we were going anywhere until late morning. Moving to the edge of the bed, Seb reluctantly got up and stared back at his phone. Neither did I, but that was Neil. Baker wants to talk to me. Sam tensed. Although she was aware Seb paid Detective Inspector Baker a large chunk of money every month to be kept informed of any goings-on concerning the firm, and made larger ad hoc payments to ensure certain things were overlooked when the need arose. What could he possibly want to see Seb for all of a sudden? The relationship with Baker had done them all favours in the past, but it also had its flaws. The detective's clout wasn't foolproof, and keeping the stokers off radar had gone wrong on a couple of occasions. Those episodes could have been disastrous had they not been averted so the prospect of the man making an impromptu visit unnerved her. Even more so when plans for a massive heist were underway. What's happened, Seb? she asked. Baker's coming to the orchid? Yes, but it won't be about anything important. Since the peacock burnt down, I haven't had a chance to touch base with him, so he'll want to remind me that our arrangement still stands, I expect. Sam bit her bottom lip. You don't think it's anything to do with that runner, do you? Seb grinned the easy smile he reserved only for her. No, I don't. That was sorted. Baker hasn't any cause to be aware of that, so don't worry, okay? Nodding, Sam leant back against the headboard whilst the ensuite shower sprang to life, hoping Seb was right with his presumption. She knew he'd dealt with the runner who'd given up the safe's codes, and although she didn't know the details, she could guess. She just prayed Seb's need for retaliation didn't consume him. How he dealt with things was not what she'd been used to, but he was fair, and she didn't want that to change. But she'd trust his judgment. Her past mistrust had almost ruined them, and she would never make that mistake again. Getting out of bed, Sam pulled on her satin robe and glanced in the cheval mirror before padding across the landing. She then moved down the stairs and grabbed the paper sticking through the letterbox. Making her way into the kitchen, she flicked on the kettle and gazed through the window into the established garden, dappled with the morning winter sun. Plants always brought a sense of calm, and Sam needed that today, because she couldn't shift the sense of foreboding creeping along her veins. Hearing the kettle come to the boil, Sam made a cup of tea and sat down at the large kitchen table to flick through the paper. Randomly scanning the pages, she stopped at the photograph of the girl killed on the night of the fire. Belatedly wishing she hadn't looked, Norsi arose. Her instincts were spot on. She thought the previously printed vague description of the victim had matched that of the girl she'd screamed all manner of insults at that night, believing her to have been the one Seb had betrayed her with. Even though she now knew what was true, the image of walking into that bedroom in her very own house to see what appeared to be the man she loved beyond anything in bed with a girl only just old enough to have left school, had floored her beyond everything. Thankfully, as that fateful night unfolded, Sam had realised her error. Seb had not betrayed her with this girl or anyone. The girl had been a victim herself, a victim of an elaborate plan. And this photo proved she was indeed that same girl, the girl used by Sam's sister, a previously unknown sister, who had been trying to kill her, kill Seb, kill all of them. Sam traced her finger over Deb Banner's photograph. Marina Devlin hadn't killed Deb. She might have killed her own brother, but being as the woman had inveigled her way into Sam's office and was busy hell-bent on putting a bullet in her brain, then she couldn't have killed the girl. Even Marina Devlin couldn't be in two places at once. But Sam couldn't help feel convinced it was all somehow connected. She shuddered, the memory of that night continuing to haunt her in a never-ending series of flashbacks. Witnessing Seb get shot had been the worst. The thought of losing him forever, unthinkable. Sam sipped her tea, 
Grateful the searing liquid distracted her from the tumult of disturbing thoughts. Of course, Seb was right. Marina would have retreated back to London by now. The woman wouldn't risk remaining in Birmingham. Not after that. But that she was out there somewhere, possibly planning to finish what she'd failed to do last time, continued to play on Sam's mind. Shaking her head, Sam returned to the paper. There wasn't anything she could do about what had happened, nor about Marina Devlin still being around. But what she could do was get further information on the disgusting creature who ran Deb Banner's place of work, the man intrinsically linked to a lot of things, the one from her mother's past, Tom Bedworth. Sam read the article accompanying the photograph. The victim killed on the night of the 6th of February in Granville Street, city centre, can now be named as Deborah Banner, 16, originally from Frankly. Miss Banner, the recipient of a vicious and purposeful attack, was run over repeatedly before the driver fled the scene. Deborah's father, Luke, is set to bury his only child tomorrow at St. Leonard's Church, Frankly. Mr. Banner said, I cannot begin to explain how devastated I am. The person responsible must be brought to justice. The incident is still under investigation and anyone with information or who witnessed anything that night is urged to contact West Midlands Police as soon as possible. Sam tapped her finger on the newsprint. Luke Banner. Did this man know what his daughter did for a living? Did he know this Tom Bedworth person that Deb had worked for? She chewed the inside of her cheek. It would make an awkward conversation but if she could locate Luke and get him to talk, she might get leads to where the scum Bedworth was hiding. Perhaps Luke Banner believed Bedworth had something to do with his daughter's murder too. He might have even seen Deb with Marina. All these people seemed to be linked, and if Sam could just speak to the man, she might learn something useful. Seb had his hands full with the heist, and, like she'd promised, she'd be there in whatever way was required but she still had her own mission, ridding Birmingham of the lowlifes grooming young girls like Deb Banner to work in the sex trade was important to her, and if any of these things were connected, it gave even more reason to pursue it. Either way, it wouldn't hurt to test the water by locating Luke Banner. Sam frowned. She could turn up at Deb's funeral, but grilling a man busy burying his daughter wasn't the best. It would also expose to onlookers that she was digging around. Instead, she needed to find out where Luke Banner lived. Frankly, wasn't a big place, so it couldn't be that difficult. Seb folded his arms and waited impatiently for Baker to get to the point. If he'd been pulled from his morning off purely to chat about the bleeding weather or the unfairness of insurance claims, then Baker could sling his bloody hook. If he couldn't spend time with Sam, like he'd prefer then he'd rather be fine-tuning his plan to intercept the container landing at Bristol Docks and getting the lowdown on those no-necks from Wolverhampton. Yeah, insurance firms are notorious for not paying out. Short of incidents with time-stamped footage, Baker continued, laughing at his own analogy. His beady eyes scrutinised Samantha Reynolds' office. It's good of your wife-to-be to allow you to use her premises whilst you're in this position. When's your wedding again? Seb's jaw tightened. Did Baker think it amusing to rub his face in the fact that he had sod all to his name at the moment? Putting this whole business straight couldn't come quick enough. And as for the wedding, it would be soon. But if Baker was angling for an invite, he would be sorely disappointed. He eyed the balding detective scornfully.